Welcome to the VO School podcast, dedicated to the art, craft, and business of voiceover. Each week builds upon the last to give you a comprehensive understanding of a career in VO. My name's Jamie Muffet. I'm a full-time voice talent and audio engineer, and I'll be joined by some of the industry's top professionals on both sides of the microphone to drill down and dig up the truth. Hello, hello. Welcome yet again to the VO School podcast. Today is going to be a little different because the tables are going to be turned on me and I'm going to be answering the questions this week. So uh, sorry about that. (laughs) Tina Perkins from Syracuse University reached out to me a little while ago and asked me if I wanted to speak to the students of the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. And of course, it was my pleasure to do that. So We actually went ahead and recorded that interaction and the questions were fantastic from the students and I really had a great time speaking with them and that is the subject of today's episode. But before we get there, as per usual I have a few things to talk about. Firstly, thank you to everyone who's signed up to our Patreon page. That's really, really fantastic. I really, really appreciate everyone's support. If you would like to help us out and also get some goodies along the way, you can join that at patreon.com slash voschool. Now, we're experimenting with something a little new on the podcast because each week I get people emailing me asking for very specific advice to do with their careers and next steps for them. And I really feel like it is a privilege that you guys reach out to me and ask me questions about this stuff, and I'm really thrilled that you do. Of course, it's very time-consuming to get back to everyone, so apologies if I haven't got back to you. Uh, I'm working through them. I'm not sure if I'm going to get to everyone, so uh, please be patient. If you do want a guaranteed quick response, if you have a question, if you want some guidance, if you want me to look at something that you've produced a demo or if you want some advice as to who to go to in your career for demo production or coaching we've set up a section on the website called guidance and as we're called vo school it felt like a an appropriate name for something like this so you can go to that part of the website and you could submit something and We can either schedule a Skype session where I talk you through what I think about your situation or I can sit down and write you an email response. It's entirely up to you. And hopefully that'll be a good service for you. So like I say, go to voschoolpodcast.com. Look up at the right hand side. There's a link to guidance. Click there and there's a submission form to put your question in and choose whether you want an email response or a Skype and we can set that up. Okay, so that's enough of me talking. We're going to have plenty of that in this episode, so I won't bore you any longer. So we'll have a couple of quick ads, and then we'll get into the interview with me by the students at Syracuse. Connect your studio to the world with IPDTL. IPDTL is a cost-effective alternative to ISDN without the need for hardware or line rental. Connect, mix, and record up to four locations at the same time, including phone patch, right from your computer. You don't need additional software as IPDTL runs in your browser, and you can even get your own ISDN number. Try a day pass for just $15 or subscribe monthly or yearly. So, for directed sessions, interviews, and of course, podcasts, choose IPDTL. The National Zoo. (laughs) Because sometimes you just need to stroke a llama. Instagram. Download it and start embarrassing your teenagers today. Resolve spot and stain. Because the dog's gonna drag his butt on the carpet. He just is. Engage the droid army with this Lego Star Wars Republic fighter tank. Hi, it's J. Michael Collins. And these are just a few examples of the first class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the demo production tab to find out more. Okay, so today I am joined by... Tina Perkins from Syracuse University, and a whole gaggle of young people, which is very exciting. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. So Tina, why don't you tell us a little about, well, first of all, give us the full name of the university, because I'm not going to remember it at all, and then tell us a little about your course and the people who are going to be joining us today. Yes. Um, 
It's a SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. Bonus points for anyone who knows what SI stands for. <laughs> I'm an adjunct pr professor here uh, teaching voiceover. And um, I myself have been in radio for about 20 plus years. And um, I've done voiceover for about 15. And I've about three years ago crossed over into teaching young students an intro into voiceover. I've uh, really had an amazing time. It's very gratifying to kind of just kind of talk about my journey as a voiceover artist mm. and then kind of pass that along to my students. I just, I just love the creativity that's involved in teaching. I feel like I've come full circle because believe it or not, I'm back in the actual studio that I took voiceover classes in back in the stone ages of the <laughs> mid 1980s. <laughs> and yes, I used to cut tape and it was on purpose. <laughs> I wasn't forced to do it, but uh, I'm very grateful for the digital age. Yes. And uh, well. <laughs> um, my students are all really, they're interested in voiceover. Some of them are interested in becoming voiceover artists. Others are in, a myriad of different classes at Syracuse University, ranging from advertising. Some students aren't, aren't even in Newhouse. They just want to kind of do this to step out of their comfort zone. So we have a lot of fun in the class. And um, I enjoy having the opportunity to kind of help them step out of their comfort zone and, and kind of avoid the red light syndrome, per se. Um, yeah. And it really just kind of teach them what what it's like to kind of go into the business from starting from ground zero. Great. Well, the tables are being turned on me a little bit today. Usually I ask the questions, but everyone's asking me questions today. That's so very good. everyone can watch me crash and burn. This will be quite fun. It'll be entertaining at huh. least. <laughs> so uh, why don't we get the first question? And that's PJ, I believe. Yes, I am PJ Conway, uh, junior here at Syracuse University. My question is, getting gigs at top advertising agencies seems daunting. Um, I know you've had these gigs before. Would you attribute this to the connections you've made after a long time spent in the industry, or does it come naturally with additions? Well, really, it's both, to be perfectly honest. Um, advertising is an interesting thing because it's changing an awful lot right now and what worked in the past is not necessarily what's going to be the case in five ten years time um it's still the case that you get big jobs through an agent and they're generally union sag after pro projects these are the national cable jobs things like that projects and to get those opportunities you have to be with a decent agency so the long and short of it is, yes, after a long time in the industry and after doing a lot of auditions, you can get to the point where you can sign with an agent, a decent agent, and that will give you the opportunities to get, uh, present yourself for these, these projects. Like I say, the advertising industry is changing so much, and particularly in voiceover, because what was the case up until this point was that they do a big campaign on TV. But now so much is shifting off the cable networks and uh, onto the internet. And there's a lot of pre-roll advertising and things like that. And those kind of projects, the the doors have been flung wide open really because the particularly the SAG-AFTRA, the, what they call it, the new media contract, I think, is very different from a, your standard commercial contract in, in SAG-AFTRA. So that means rates are very different and the whole industry is thrown into turmoil. So casting directors might have a hard time in this new era uh, because rates are so much lower and production houses and ad agencies may be casting themselves. There's a whole other thing that's happened recently, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, which is Voice Bank was acquired by a online marketplace, one of the biggest ones in the industry. We're not going to say the name today. Um, <laughs> Voice Bank was a way that talent were scouted essentially through their agency by people who were looking for them. So ad agencies, production houses, stuff like that, they would use VoiceBank. Now it's been acquired, that's not 
route isn't quite so clear and the dust is still still settling on that and there are a few voice bank type organizations starting up so the long and short of that which is a really meandering answer is that who knows going into the future how you're going to get into these big contracts because whether they even exist is is up for debate but how you get there how you get onto these uh, people's radars is shifting in its own right What's always going to be consistent is that the better you are, the bigger, the the higher the chance you'll get of booking the gig. And if you stay really current as to what is on TV, on pre-roll advertising, um, on Hulu, whatever it is, uh, you stand a good chance. Now, I would say agents aren't just going to disappear. So getting on an agency roster, a good agency roster as a goal is still Uh, an extremely good way of getting there and pretty much the only way to get onto like a McDonald's commercial campaign. Um, So that would be the current way of getting there and probably for the short term. But yeah, how long that's going to be the case, I don't know. Maybe it's all going to go online and we'll see. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, sure. Um, Next on deck, uh, we have J.D. Kello, who's going to ask a question. Okay. So, J.D., uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, hello, Jamie. My name is J.D. Killo. I'm a junior here at Newhouse. I'm in television, radio, film, and political science. Um, in television, I'm mostly focused on writing. So uh, my, my question, I'm guessing, is what is the best way going about trying various voices for the same character? Hmm. That's, that's interesting because it depends on the project. You know, if it's a video game, for example, um, you tend to get this huge backstory. You get artwork and all this kind of stuff. And it's really interesting. You know, they go into the most insane level of degree of uh, sort of sculpting this character. They've thought an awful lot about it. They talk, they've obviously had meetings and they've talked with the writers and the directors get together and they discuss this. So when you um, either go to a casting in person or you receive something via email, you have a lot to go on. Now, really the way I tend to work with that is I go with my gut a lot of the time and I look at the character and I see their physicality and that really helps to inform what their character is going to sound like. Now, the thing with trying various voices is with with a character that's got certain qualities and it's got this huge backstory, I personally tend to go one way. And if it's not right, <laughs> you know, so be it. Um, the bit, the difference is is that if you go to an in person casting, you're working with a casting director, and they can help you sculpt whatever you've whatever direction you've gone into something that maybe is more appropriate for the character, or if they know that the production company is looking for something different. It's harder when you're doing that on your own when you're submitting an audition from from your own studio. Um, so, if you speak to any actor with, about any character that they work on i think they know that character intimately and i think it would be very difficult for them to just jump into that character being a whole different person with a different sound and uh different characteristics um so frankly uh that's sort of my approach to characterization is to really get in there and get under the hood with the uh who that character is um and then make adjustments from there i'm going to talk about this a little bit later but you know, a character is so much more than just the sound of a voice. You know, it's not just a, the sound of a character. It, it has three dimensions. And uh, that's the way I, I work. I, I really try and get to the nub of what that character is. And then, you know, you know, we, we can shift from there. So, Okay, well, thank you. That was very helpful. Oh, pleasure. Next up, uh, we have Estelle Liu, who is a graduate student in advertising. And uh, Estelle has an accent, so she has a question regarding her accent. Okay. Hello, Jamie. Um, This is Estelle. I'm a graduate student of Advertising Newhouse. So my question is, as a foreigner who has a lot of interest in English voice acting, I would like to know how important the accent of the voice talent is. If it counts much, how can I practice it in a very effective way? Um, Well... I would say accents in general are 
extremely important and everyone has an accent uh <laughs> within english there are <laughs> thousands um even within england there are there are hundreds um so you know have it, i if accents were important i probably wouldn't have a career because <laughs> i milk mine for all it's worth um finding a niche is something that is going to really help you in your career so the fact that you have an accent how would you define your accent before we go ahead um i think cuz i'm chinese so maybe the pronunciation is not that correct or standard but do you have a a chinese accent so um that in itself is immediately a niche now with regard to sort of maybe reducing your accent or say americanizing your accent i would definitely say that um working with it so that it is as clear and understandable to an american audience as possible and i have to do the same thing there are certain phrasings that i use and pronunciations of words that don't make sense and i still slip up on that all the time and being embedded in america as you are which that that really helps of course um in terms of your accent i wouldn't i wouldn't say that you should necessarily have a goal of sort of eliminating your accent and creating this english I don't know whether you mean British English or American English accent because you're always going to be one step behind a native. <laughs> and I thought this when I first came to this this country that there was such a temptation to put on American for auditions it would increase the amount of auditions that I get, but I'm always going to be one step behind an American however good they are because it's their instinctive natural accent. So What's interesting is that you know you have this Chinese accent but maybe it'll work out that your Asian qualities uh really serve you well in terms of being a more global voice. So you might at some point in the future realize that uh having a global non-American non-British voice is really beneficial. If you listen to the episode that we did with Paul Strickvader, he is a Dutch uh voice talent based in Pennsylvania actually not too far from me. And although he's Dutch, he does a lot of work as the like Euro guy. <laughs> And he's his accent is not particularly uh easily definable. Um and so if someone doesn't want a straight up British or American accent and they want something a bit sort of mainland European, he has marketed himself in such a way that means he's the guy that gets a lot of the work a lot of that work so um not sure i could really help you in terms of specific accent techniques to improve or i don't want to say improve adjust your accent to something more american or more british um you'd probably want to speak to a dialect coach about that but um i would say don't be in too much of a rush to rush away from what you are as a person and what you do which is could be potentially a a useful niche. I I her voice is very unique and I have I think t- uh three or four students that have uh accents who have asked me what can I do to get rid of it and I say mm. you don't want to get rid of it it it's what cuts through the clutter and what makes you unique. Yeah. Just work on your diction and just smoothing out your delivery don't get rid of the accent because it doesn't sound like anyone else and why would you want to get to sound like someone else when you have a totally unique voice that I would give anything for personally right e- exactly i mean particularly when you come to america there are th- 300 million people in this country who has this i have this accent <laughs> you know it's like you got a lot of competition so having having your accent is immediately putting you in a different bracket And um, at the same time, you know, and I suffer from this as well, you're also in a smaller pool of work, of course. And uh if you're not in I don't know if your your Chinese accent is as a result of you being brought up in China, but if from from my perspective, I am not in England, so I don't have immediate access to the English market, but I'm in America and there's a smaller pool of work. So I'm in a little bit of an awkward situation in some respects, but having like you say having that ability to focus your marketing efforts um really reach out for certain projects and you know ignore other areas is is a massive advantage when it comes to you know your day to day workload and where you choose to focus what you do um 
because you know it's it's a huge industry really with a million different avenues that you can go down so yeah so don't lose it use it <laughs> yeah thank totally. you very much um next up uh we have a justin zarian media studies graduate character voice extraordinaire yeah <laughs> I don't know. Extraordinaire is kind of a high praise. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, I am a graduate student. I'm currently in my final semester for a media studies degree and uh, very, very excited. It's a whole lot of work, just to say. Yeah, um, I bet. But so uh, my first question here, I have a little context for it. So uh, this is a question I asked Jess Harnell and Gray Delisle, uh, two actors who I really, really admire a lot uh, during a mm. Comic-Con convention. I just realized that's redundant comic con convention. Anyway, <laughs> uh, funny. So the qu- context was that I talked to them about a TV show that Gray was about to do, uh, which is that fe- the Women of DC superhero show, and she was taking over to play Wonder Woman on that one. Right. And I had a situation in an acting class where I tried to do a scene from a video game, and I was told I was trying too much to be like the actor who was playing the character there. Mm. And I just think to myself, I'm like. Well, yeah, that's how I know the voice is because I know the delivery of that actor. So my question is, um, if you're tasked to voice, say, an iconic character or a character that's already established, um, that's been voiced by many actors, what's the best way to stay consistent with what's, you know, the original delivery while also adding your own unique spin to it? Well, I think it really depends on the project. Um if they're looking for a voice match, you know, it's it's an easy, you know, easy direction to go. It's obvious they want someone to sound like X person. Um, you know, that's happened with various, you know, superheroes and things like that in the past where they just want someone to sound the same. You know, same as like, you know, Porky Pig and, you know, characters like that. They just want someone to sound like Porky Pig and Bob mm-hmm. Bergen does a great job at that. Um, but other times they're looking to sort of reinvent the the franchise and go in a different direction. And so, you know, again, the characters are three dimensional, you know, they have a backstory, they have physicality, they have their own unique emotional sort of grounding. And I would start from that point. And, you know, chances are you'll probably end up in a similar place because obviously it's the same character played by different people, but their emotions and everything and their history and their personality are are the same so chances are you'll end up in a similar place but i wouldn't in that case get too hung up on a previous performance um you know it also depends on you know how you were hired for the gig or if this is an audition that's come in and they've stated that we're going to reinvent batman you know like uh, this is this is what we want to do blah 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 that tells you everything you need to know really and then you can go into that character development with yourself you know you can look at why that character is the way that they are and why they have that certain sense of humor and why they uh, bark certain things or whatever it has happens to be so just because the character has been played before i don't know if there's um any reason why you wouldn't go into that same level of um detail in terms of building up that character and you know if you're submitting yourself along with 50 to 100 other people and you go to that level of detail and you bring something different to the table, uh, I think that stands you in good stead because everyone is going to be trying to sound like the previous iterations of the character. So you're just going to be lumped in with a group of other people. So if it's not a voice match, I would say really go with that sort of investigative side of your brain and and really sort of dig down and look at the character and why they are the way they are and then use your creativity and, and work with that. Excellent. Yeah, no, it's just, uh, it's always fun to hear those kind of stories from people who are in the business. I remember Jess Harnell telling me the story about how he got cast as Wacko, where pretty much everyone was reading that type of like zany, like, hey, kind of character. And yeah. <laughs> he just had a, on a whim just go, why don't I read it like Ringo Starr? <laughs> and right. that's pretty much how I got the part. So, okay, well, that, that's good. That's good feedback for auditions. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I mean, really, the, the 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 riskiest thing you can do in an audition, I think, is to play it safe and to do something that's kind of obvious. Um, it seems counterintuitive to be like that, but the amount of times 
where I've just gone out on a limb. You know, sometimes you get <laughs> wildly wrong, but <laughs> you know, you you only ever book a small percentage of the the projects you go up for anyway. But um, taking a risk on a on an audition is actually not that risky in the bigger picture. Um, so yeah, I can totally see how that was that was the case. I've I, that's certainly been the case with me on projects. I've done whole other accents. Uh, I did a character for a video game where they were asking for one accent and <laughs> it was a bit risky, but I was just like, nah, that's not the right accent. Cause I, it was a regional British accent and I knew, just knew that it wasn't quite right. And whereas you should, you know, generally the rule is you stick with the specs. Um, I was just like, no, I really, I'm really feeling strongly that it should be this way. And, and I think it stood me in good. It clearly did. Cause I booked a gig. So um, yeah, I would say, being bold and taking taking a bit of a creative risk is is not necessarily a an actual risky practice. I agree. I, it's fantastic when it works out and you get a yes. But yeah. if I'm going to get a no, I'd rather get a no for leaving it all on the table. <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. instead of wondering, oh, should I have done that? Should I have said it that way? You'll never yeah. know <laughs> yeah. until you try. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Uh, our next question is coming from Eddie Seaman. He's a graduate. Internal, uh, international relations, excuse me. Um, which question did you want to ask? You have about two or three here. Um, yes. Um, thank you for introducing me. Um, as welcome. you said, <laughs> my name is Eddie Saman. I'm a dual degree graduate oh, student. Sorry, Saman. At, yeah, uh, at Syracuse University. And uh, my question is, do you recommend young talents to focus on one aspect or genre of voiceover that is best suitable for their voice type or to try and improve all kinds of voiceover styles to maximize their chances of getting more w roles or work? Yeah, well, particularly when you're young or at least when you're starting out in the industry, you don't, what you think may be your style and your genre may not actually end up being the one that you, you book work in. So you sort of have no choice but to sort of experiment a bit. Um, but you don't necessarily want to experiment to the point at which you embarrass yourself in public because <laughs> that's not going to help your career either. Um, the only way of trying stuff out is experimentation. Um, and, you know, you can do that in the privacy of your own home. You can go to classes. You can even do, uh, you can form some kind of local work group where you have friends, you know, say new house there, you might have four or five people to get together every week and, work on characters or work on one week you do promos, one week you do commercial, blah, blah, blah. But at some point you've got to uh, go out into the market and, you know, see what happens. So while you're young, of course, you know, why not try every aspect of, of uh, the industry? You know, you just never really know. You know, the other thing is that even if you do focus in on one area of this, in this industry and you start to get work in it, it might change you know this industry does change an awful lot all the time fashions come and go what was once this big booming masculine voice but booked everything no longer really works too much anymore particularly in commercial so it's good to um spread your eggs <laughs> so to speak um and you know have a, a few sort of strings to your bow with me i had no idea going into this industry that I would book so much like rough, tough guy voices because I'm fairly softly spoken. I don't, I never really scream and shout, but I went to one audition and it required me yelling my head off and I'd never really done it as an adult. <laughs> it was a revelation when I realized I could yell really loudly. Um, and ever since then, I've booked a fair amount of <laughs> work that way because I knew I could do it. Um, so it's interesting to um, put yourself out there and try different stuff because, uh, you know, sometimes you can surprise yourself with what you can do and, you know, what work you book. So um, I would say absolutely, yes, experiment. And then, you know, use the, you know, a sort of mathematical, analytical approach to work out where you're getting positive feedback. And then you can start honing in things a little bit. Then you can use that of that knowledge to help with your marketing and you know with what right. auditions you choose to go to and uh what agents even to approach you know who specialize in certain genres and things like that so yeah i would say right. try a lot out to start with and then specialize after well thank you very much pleasure okay cameron you're up 
Hello, uh, my name is Cameron Merrick. I'm a television, radio, and film junior. It says psychology on here, but I'm infinitely too lazy to be a double major. <laughs> um, I was wondering, how much do you think a newcomer needs to invest in production values before breaking into the field? And I meant mostly as in like money, as in microphones, equipment, and such, but also, I, I guess, time also factors into that. How long do you think someone needs to be doing this for? Uh, well, um, s yes. <laughs> Do you have um, a closet? <laughs> <laughs> right. Seriously, a closet is such a fantastic location to use for a recording studio. But yes, production values are hugely important and they're getting even more important. Pretty much everyone has a home studio now. Having said that, you don't actually have to spend an awful lot of money to make a studio, a home studio sound really good. This sort of 80-20 rule really applies you can basically get 80% of the way there with 20% of the investment financially. Um, as you say, knowledge is hugely important with that. If you know what you're doing, you can take a pretty average sounding microphone and make a really good sounding voiceover. <laughs> the most important thing is, is the room that you're recording in by far where I am right now is a far from optimal space. Um, but if you put all this set up in a really good, booth which i have next door the only reason i'm not there is i don't have a webcam in there but if you put a really simple setup in a great room you can create a broadcast standard voiceover no problem so to do that you have to have certain amount of knowledge of acoustics of course and some recording and hardware as in microphones and preamps interfaces stuff like that so i would invest time like you say into this as opposed to thinking that you have to wait for money to solve your problems because it, if you can save up let's say 500 bucks for a microphone and a and a fairly humble interface but you you use your wits and your nous <laughs> to set up a, a decent home environment you can submit to national tv commercials and get on the air without question you do not need a three to five thousand dollar microphone those extremely expensive microphones and preamps and EQs and compressors and stuff like that, they probably add four or five percent of polish on top of what you can get for a very humble budget. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of producers and editing people, they're going to be compressing the hell out of your voice. They're going to be mixing it with music. They're going to be chopping it up. And, you know, all those that money and the time and the effort to get that few extra percent of a quality may well be completely thrown out anyway when it comes out of your phone or out of a you know car stereo or whatever um so the reason it's so important particularly at the audition stage is that it can give you a little bit of an advantage now if you're going up for a project that has 50 to 100 submissions and that's not unheard of sometimes up to 200 I think J. Michael Collins talked about this in the previous episode, that if you cast a project and you get 200 people responding, a good 80% of them will be immediately thrown out because the audio quality is not good enough. So you don't want to be in that group to start yeah. off with. So that's your first <laughs> hurdle. Get out of that group and into the 20%, 15, 20% of people that are in that next group. Then you're judged more on how you interpret the script and blah, blah, blah. And then if your voice is the right, sounds like it's the right age, if you're nailing the specs, if you've got the right tone, blah, 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 and you're up against one or two other people, then what do you think is going to be the differentiator? It could be that the person who's casting it is simply subconsciously drawn to yours because it sounds a little bit better than the other two people. Or it could be that they know they're not going to be hiring a studio and they want that audio to be a little bit better. So they might be swayed to go with you. So yes, I really do think that production values matter. And with more and more people entering this industry and the industry exploding in size, um, it's only going to become more important as you need to differentiate yourself. Excellent. Thank you. That's very helpful, especially considering I do not have money. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is a fellow podcaster, <laughs> Matt Mitchell. Ah, great. 
Hi, Jamie. Uh, hey. Yes, my name is Matt Mitchell. I'm a graduate student here at Syracuse. Uh, you were actually kind enough to listen to and critique uh, my podcast, The Forgotten Famous. So uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I recognize your voice. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, of course. Uh, my question is about enthusiasm. So when providing voiceover for narrative scripts, uh, which I do a, a great deal of not only in that podcast, but also for public radio, uh, there's a fine line between having a lot of enthusiasm and energy um, and going too far and having it lose a conversational tone. Mm. Uh, are there any tips or suggestions for maintaining the correct amount of energy and zeal without it becoming uh, too much? As in you being yourself or you being a character? Oh, I guess being so for uh, narrative, self-driven uh, uh, voiceover in which I'm not playing a character, I'm, d I'm delivering something informative. Yeah, so like your podcast, basically. Yes. Um, yeah, well, I think if you're excited and you're enthusiastic and you've got something to say that's that you're really thrilled to, to say, um, you don't want to fight the fact that you're being enthusiastic. But you're not going to be like that from the start to the end of the script. You know, I, I'm thinking back to your podcast, and um, I'm not sure if this is really where you're going in terms of for your podcast, but um, there's got to be light and shade in any script, I think. And, um, you know, if you listen to really, really good podcasts, you know, sort of the NPR type podcasts, they have those moments where they're really speaking passionately and enthusiastically because they're feeling it. That's that's what they're trying to get across. So um, I would look at the story as a whole and really analyze. And you can, I mean, you can even use like sort of colored uh, highlighters and stuff like that mm -hmm. to mark on the script where, you know, you want to emphasize things and where you want to pull back. And if you're a little bit more intimate, you can get a little closer to the mic and the mic somehow picks up more emotion. You know, I, I hesitate to say because, you know, you can be emotional and, and be loud and obnoxious, but um, you can be more intimate and you can get closer to the mic and you can hear all the little nuances, all the little shakes and wobbles in your voice when you when you say something with real intensity and real passion. And that can come through in a way that is more authentic. Mm -hmm. And one thing to consider is that don't confuse volume, <laughs> and I mean literal volume, with energy. Um, you can be energetic and uh excitable and, and everything without really yelling and screaming. Now, what's really hard is knowing where your baseline is because, you know, your mood can change. You can be in a different frame of mind or whatever but with every session. But um, I've picked up on the fact that I get a lot of feedback over the years saying, Jamie, give us, just give us a little more. <laughs> so my default is to underplay it a little. So I know that. So I try and, I try and go with my instinct plus 5%. You know, and that's my sort of default when I go into the booth and, and do a gig. Of course, then you could say, the, well, then you get used to that and then what you're adding 5% on that and then you're overdoing it. But, you know, it's just a case of keeping track of feedback, um, what people um, are saying to you regularly and adjusting because you've always got work to do, you know, and everything's constantly shifting. And while one thing may be improved, you may be pulling, you know, lacking in, in another area. I think also... Um, Try not to think about what you sound like. I know I keep probably hammering this home, but forget about the sound of your voice. And also when you're wearing headphones, people can get kind of fall in love with their voice a little bit. And they obsess about the, the sound of it as opposed to their intention, what they're really trying to impart. That's such an important um, part of storytelling. It's, you know, when you have a good storyteller, it, it isn't how great they sound, it's how well they tell the story. So... You know, one, one thing you can practice is you can read a line and then put the page down and then say a line without looking at the page. And sometimes that um, that is an interesting exercise because you're vocalizing a thought versus just reading, you know, reciting something, which is slightly different. And if you hopefully get to the point where you can read your, your script, read a script, re read as a character even... Um, rather than just reading words on a page, that authenticity will come through a little more. I'm kind of rambling here, but um, I think, you know, like there's a lot 
that goes into that conversational, comfortable thing. <laughs> and it's not very easy when you start out because everyone tenses up when they when the mic comes on. Um, it's kind of stressful. And you have to sort of, it's the hardest thing in the world to get back to your regular comfortable voice plus considering all the other things you have to do when, you, when you're doing voiceover. So um, if you can extrapolate some kind of feedback from that, well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Jamie, thank you. You know, I think the, the feedback about uh, being able to deliver something without looking at it certainly always gives it a, a richer and more genuine quality. Mm. It can be tricky when there's, you know, a script might be, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of words. You don't always have the luxury, though, if you do, it's always better. But I really appreciate the the color coding system. I use that a lot when when uh, building a story or when cutting audio in general. I've never thought about that as a final VO script coding it uh, for emotional levels. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, the reading off the page thing, um, that's really a case of resetting your brain a little bit to go, well, what, what, why am I sounding so robotic? Why am I sounding so intense and it's not sounding conversational? Just do that, read a line and then put it down and then read the line away from your uh, reading voiceover and analyze why that's different and think, okay, so I'm doing this and I'm sounding like that and my shoulders are more relaxed and you know I'm thinking about what I'm saying versus reading it and then go back into the script and then try and incorporate what you've analyzed into the rest of the script. So sometimes it just takes getting out of a certain headspace and into a new headspace and you know you can carry on from there. Absolutely. Thanks, Jamie. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next up, we have Gwen Carr, public communications, television, yeah. radio, film, and philosophy. Ooh. It's, it's an interesting combination. Yeah. Yeah, the philosophy part, it's uh, it's lots of writing, but it's very confusing. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. Um, so, uh, hi, Jamie. I'm, uh, I'm Gwen. I'm a, I'm a junior. I'm a... TV, radio, film major. Um, so my first question, it's about sort of like the the, the difference between techniques um, in terms of like voice acting and voiceover. So like, are there any difference, like important differences in how you approach doing uh, like voiceover commercially versus uh, like voice acting for a character? Well, firstly, I, th- I, I know what you mean by the two by the differences. Um, but mm-hmm. I, I think the terms are interchangeable actually. Um, mm-hmm. the, it's all voice acting and it's all voiceover. Yeah. But I know what you mean, the sort of more uh, character based as opposed to just uh, more commercial. Mm-hmm. Um, from a technical, do you mean from a technical standpoint in terms of how I vocalize things or how I actually go ahead and record them? I, I'm thinking more like, um, like you mentioned before, how you sort of like, when you're doing a video game, they give you like all this characterization that sort of gives you the voice, like more like how do you approach like getting that Mm. voice in a different situation? Yeah. Well, in a way it's, um, it's similar. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, there's always going to be a story, even for the most dry corporate (laughs) (laughs) e-learning script, you know, there's always going to be something that they're trying to say. There's always going to be a story, it's much harder work and it's much more boring to do <laughs> e-learning corporate onboarding script versus some crazy character in a video game, of course. But um, the the basic rules, I think, are the same. You want to know what the the character or the, um, the person that you're playing, what their intention is. So if it is a dry corporate thing and you're explaining how to work some piece of machinery, you know, you you have to understand who the audience is. You know, they may, I mean, I've had specs that say we want it to sound boring, (laughs) which I don't really understand, (laughs) but like there's that. And then there's also the, you know, the tone of the company, you know, you may want to consider what, you know, look on YouTube and check out their their TV ads and stuff like that. So while it's obvious in something like a video game or an animation or something uh, that you have to research the character and prepare yourself, and it's much more critical in something like that, uh, there's also an element of that in the more commercial side too. Um, Commercials in particular, they tend to be completely obsessed with the 
the tone and the vibe, you know, mm -hmm. of the read yeah. because it completely represents their brand. Mm -hmm. So when you go in and you do, um, you know, a 25, 30 second commercial and you're saying one line of text, you, you can do it a hundred times mm -hmm. and they're trying to get this certain emotion across. So you've got to use a certain amount of uh, creativity to um, change one line in a myriad of ways to impart a certain emotion, which is the same as a character in an animation or a video game. So, um, you know, there, there are technical differences in terms of on a TV narration, for example, you'll get right up on the mic and you can be very intense and talk about the, the process and blah, blah, blah. This happens when this happened to so-and-so mm -hmm. person. Um, and you're not going to be doing that if you're trying to sell some sealant <laughs> product, <laughs> you know, late at night. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there there are a lot of similarities. Um, and I, I sort of think that everything is acting because I don't mm -hmm. really care about selling you a sofa, <laughs> you know, so I'm pretending that I do, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. just as much as I'm pretending, you know, I'm a sort of warlock or something. <laughs> um, so, you know, to different degrees, yes, there's a lot of crossover, I think. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like, because uh, whenever I, I would do like, we would do like commercial stuff, it's always a struggle of like, I really want to do this ironically because I don't believe it at all. <laughs> but I have to sort of make it a character and sell it, you know, myself. So, yeah, talking about, like, characters, like, um, that leads into my second question of, like, when, you, when you're going about discovering or, or sort of finding out, like, a vo the voice that fits for the, the, the situation, the role, mm. um, what, like, really makes, like, what, when you find that voice, what really makes you say, ooh, like, that's it, like, that's the one? Well, it's not, to me, it's quite instinctive when I see artwork really, really helps mm -hmm. because it immediately gets me in the ballpark. And then as soon as you look into the backstory of the character, that informs so many other things as well. You know, why they would mm -hmm. talk slowly or fast or, or be cynical about everything or, um, you know, whatever it is, whatever the characteristics are. And you know, all these um, different elements come into play. And I can't really tell you what goes on in my brain. Um, <laughs> I know that it comes together at the point where I'm absolutely convinced that I know this is what the character should sound like. And then I'm completely wrong because the casting director's like, no, that sounds awful. Yeah, well, get out. <laughs> um, but that is just the way that it is, really. And it's not really up to me to be like, you know, well, it, I suppose it is up to me to feel like I'm nailing the character because if I wasn't, that wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing it justice. But um, mm -hmm. whether or not you get hired for that is is out of your hands, of course. You know. Yeah. So, so, so it's almost like you you sort of learn about this character, and it's like, if I were to met, meet them in real life, like just like how would they sound, and then try and mimic that, right? In a sense, no. You want to. You want to. You don't want to meet them. You want to be them. Well, yeah. Like. If I were them, like if if like put yourself into the character shoes. If I was this person, hmm. how would I sound through like all this, all the backstory and how I look and such? You know. Yeah, yeah, like, that's yeah. exactly right. You are you are you know putting yourself in their shoes for that ten fifteen minutes whenever you're whatever you're doing in that audition room, and you're completely mm -hmm. forgetting that you're Gwen. You know, like it's just. It, you're yeah. that whole different person for that moment, and I think if you if you invest that much, if you truly use your imagination, even if you're in a a cold audition space and there's a person sat opposite you with a microphone and just yells action, and then <laughs> it's really not the right <laughs> environment to imagine your little hobgoblin guy in the forest. You know, <laughs> you have to use your imagination to truly believe you're, that you're there and. Why that adds that extra few percent of authenticity, I, I don't know how it comes across, but it does. Mm -hmm. We have a workshop here in, in this studio where I am right now every month, and we have people come in, and I can tell immediately when they're believing what they're saying versus just reading a script. And I couldn't really tell you exactly wh why, um, mm -hmm. but so many times when you remind them, like, truly believe what you're saying, if you're scared, feel like, What's it like to feel scared? Like really, really, 
you know, feel that emotion, it it comes across so much more authentically um, than just trying to sound like a scared person, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that's kind of vague, but... <laughs> Yeah, that that makes total sense. That, thank you very much. That's fantastic oh, advice. Um, actually, that's a good transition into our next question from Logan Piercy. Uh, public communications, TRF, and music history and cultures. It's a long title. Um, you, your question is uh, regarding common pitfalls that can set voice actors behind in their career, which is kind of something... That if you don't believe what you're saying when you're saying it, or you can't get into the mind of the copywriter, that could set you a little bit behind. And uh, what are some other common pitfalls? Yeah, I was wondering. Uh, obviously, you don't have to name names, but I was wondering about like any like personal like <laughs> anecdotes of like people you know in the industry that like have like the potential and the talent to do this, but like the certain little things that people might do, mistakes you might make. It can be in terms of, like their performance or the the way they interact with other people in industry, but there's like little things that can hold people back from really stepping into the next level of their career. Yeah, I mean, I see it quite a lot. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of small things that you can do. Um, I think you sort of have to have um, I don't know eight, ten different things you have to sort of nail <laughs> to to consistently work. You know, you it's quite easy to book the old gig but what's hard is to just constantly work and and do this full time and build relationships and maintain relationships so that you keep working um there's a ton of stuff like i know people who have a great voice but they don't take direction you know they've got the pipes it's so frustrating you hear them and they're like god you got this amazing voice but they don't seem to want to adapt <laughs> to any situation um I hear this a fair amount. Um, taking direction is actually a huge thing. Um, hearing feedback on something and then adjusting your read to what that person wants. It's very difficult to do when you're starting out, but um, so many people have a hard time with that. Um, not developing a thick skin. That's that's another one. You know, I'm not trying to say this is like Vietnam, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, you, you do face a lot of rejection and criticism and... You know, you do not book the vast majority of the work that you put your sh- put yourself forward for. So you just have to live with that and deal with it. And there are times when you're in the studio and you, you're receiving criticism and maybe someone's a little frustrated that you can't get what they're expecting you to get. And you just have to stay calm and carry on and just try your best. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You may have done a job that you really, really we're thrilled to get and then they cut you and you don't get used um it's very disappointing and that i think is a big reason why people stop doing this job um there are people that rant online about clients which is you know career suicide Uh um and uh you know they moan about or they they break ndas you know and they talk about projects that they've been hired for and then they the client hears about it and they flip out and then they don't work for them ever again. And you know, that, that gets around very quickly. Um, they don't seem to want to adapt. Uh, maybe they booked, I was talking about this earlier, maybe they've been booking something a lot and then fashions change and they refuse to move with those, those changes. Um, that's another reason why people fall out of the industry or don't achieve what they possibly could. There are a lot of, there are a lot of things really um sometimes people's marketing is just crap you know Uh, they might have a great voice but they refuse to um think about how they're presenting themselves you know so they just don't get in front of the right people i suppose the big one is that they're maybe rude in a session you know not professional they turn up late um these little things all add up to just being not worth working with if you're hiring a studio and all the creatives showed up at the studio and you're consistently half an hour late every session then no one's going to work with you again so there's there's kind of a lot of things really and i kind of rattled that off surprisingly easily (laughs) um how you can sabotage yourself and uh so it's just safe to try and nail everything (laughs) what is the harshest thing you've ever heard as a critique uh, of someone else or of me. you of you yeah 
Oh, I never received critical review. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't think off the top of my head. I've definitely had moments in studios where they've left the talk back on and they didn't realize and they're like, yeah, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of hard to hear. <laughs> they're like looking at you through the glass and saying that they don't like it or whatever. Nothing's nothing really bad, to be perfectly honest, but... You said Vietnam, so I was I was wondering if you'd actually experienced anything really harsh before. <laughs> no, no, definitely no. It's not Vietnam. <laughs> no, I mean some people try and make out that this is like such a tough job, which it really isn't. You know, it's like uh, it's a great job, but um, you know, if if you don't have a thick skin, if you're very sort of sensitive about receiving criticism or directional feedback, you know, it's going to be horrible. <laughs> um, if you can get over your ego, you know, you know, it's not a, it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, thank you. Yeah, all that is super helpful. Sure. Thanks, Logan. Cool. Okay. All right. uh, yeah. <laughs> we're in the home stretch. Uh, Leo yeah. Tully. We have one more after this. Yeah. Junior. Public communications, television, radio, and film, and political science. Whoa. What is your question? <laughs> Can we talk about politics instead? <laughs> <laughs> uh. So uh, the question that I have is kind of about figuring out where your voice is best suited for as far as kind of work and character. Um, Mm. So is it really just a matter of kind of casting a really wide net with different types of auditions and figuring what sticks from there? Or is it better to kind of aim for some kind of specific voice or some kind of specific work and sort of mold yourself around that? Uh, The former, particularly when you're starting, because, you know... You don't really know where you're going to be suited. Um, you can guess, but like I said earlier, I didn't know that I was such a great shouter. <laughs> um, and I always thought back in the day that I'd book uh, these like cool t- car TV ads and stuff like that. I could do that. And I've never, never, ever even had a sniff of that. For some reason, <laughs> it just never works. Just My voice doesn't work for it. And um, I just can't seem to nail those reads. So what you think you're going to be good at and what you think you're not going to be nailing might not necessarily come to pass. So um, you also may may find something that you really love. You may think you want to get into animation, but then when you get in a room full of other people and the pressure's on or you have to do like mocap or something, you have to remember lines and stuff, it might be just too stressful. So I would say if you can experiment with different genres within voiceover absolutely you should do um particularly if there's not a lot riding on it you obviously like i said earlier you don't want to be too awful that you (laughs) you give yourself a bad reputation if you're so far out of your your comfort zone um i'm not going to be auditioning for an eight-year-old boy you know i'm i can't do it i can't make it i can't pass it would just be embarrassing if i went into a studio if i went into a casting saying that I could do that, it would just, just wouldn't work, you know, it'd be idiotic. So, you know, within obvious logical bounds, yes, absolutely. And then use that sort of analytical part of your brain to go, right, so I seem to be doing, I seem to be getting more feedback on this and, you know, having more of success in this area and this area. So that'll help me focus on what coaching I go into. And maybe you choose to if you're getting, if you're booking work in a certain area, you really want to double down on that. So I would say then choose to work with a coach on really maximizing that because, you know, it's, um, like I said earlier, finding niches is, is really, really useful to help with your marketing and your outreach and trying to find clients and trying to, uh, you know, approaching the right agent and going to the right ad, ad agency or video game production company, whoever it is. So, you know, when you're young and when you're starting out, you know, you you should just sort of experiment with all kinds of things, really. Um, You know, if it is in the commercial promo TV narration world, that's in a sort of a bracket. If you're in the video game and the animation world, that's in a sort of its own bracket as well. So you can experiment separately with those and then sort of guesstimate where you're going to be leaning and then prioritize from there. So, yeah, I think try try tons of stuff out. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure. Pleasure. And last, but definitely not least, Brittany Ortiz, sure. public communications, television, radio, and film senior. 
Um, so my question for you, Jamie, is just you've maintained a successful podcast. And um, how do you cre- keep the creative topics flowing to discuss? Because after doing it for so long, I can imagine, you know, you got to flex that that brain. So how do you, when you experience a creative rut, how do you kind of kick it? Well, it hasn't happened yet because I haven't actually been doing it that long. I've, I've only been doing it about six months. Uh, this this VO school podcast, anyway. Um, it's an eternity for me. <laughs> it feels it feels like forever. Yeah. Um, I mean, for one thing, I'm fairly familiar with the subject matter. You know, obviously the the voiceover industry I've been in for about over ten years. Um, you know, the reason I did it actually was because I had the bit between my teeth because there was and there still is so much false information out there and predatory coaches and demo mills and all these people that are out to exploit new entrants to the industry. So I had such a, you know, sort of rocket up my ass to to get this podcast off the ground. And, you know, there is a huge amount of areas to cover in voiceover because it is sort of this multi-headed beast. Um, You know, I have a bigger picture of what I want to do with the podcast and every episode is sort of just another little chapter along there. So while it's not completely, um, I'm not totally planned everything to the sort of nth degree, um, I've got a pretty good idea of what's coming up and where I'm heading with everything. So regarding podcasting, I haven't hit that point, if I'm being completely honest, where I've hit a creative block um, the hardest thing has been scheduling people in and um, that sort of informs what order the episodes come in more than anything else. Uh, how do you stimulate creativity? Um, I think if you find yourself doing the same thing day in, day out, seeing the same people, going to the same places, it's it can just put you in that rut, just that, that in itself. Um, so changing things up, changing your schedule up, changing who you see, going to new places and experiencing things. Um, actually experiencing things as a human is is never going to be a, a bad thing for an actor because you can always draw on those experiences. You know, there's a certain part of you when something bad happens, part, you know, you can sort of file some of those, those feelings and those things away into a certain compartment in your brain and go, well, okay, this is, this is terrible, but I might be able to use this later. <laughs> and, you know, I think all of that stuff, all that sort of uh, uh, flotsam and jetsam of uh, life can help stimulate your creativity if you find yourself in, in a rut. Do you ever get an audition where you say, oh, how am I going to approach this? How about as that's kind of a rut sort of? Or do you, yeah, or do you well, have a recurring character that you do where how do you breathe new life into it? Yeah, sometimes you get auditions where the specs seem to contradict themselves. <laughs> Um, Mm -hmm. And you have to sort of decide which direction you're going to go in. Um, And then it's sort of, you're using creativity then, I suppose, to sort of interpret things. I mean, I never get too hung up on auditions because, you know, when you receive an audition with specs, um, generally it's, they're written as a team (laughs) and you realize that you're getting a lot of conflicting stuff in there so you have to sort of unpick it a little bit so you do have to use a sort of creative side of your brain to um to get you out of that hole i think and you use knowing what to ignore is almost as important as what to focus on in that instance you know well thank you so much jamie um just to cl- i guess since i'm the person going last closing <laughs> this out yeah. what's the one thing you want a listener to take away from your six month <laughs> just started um podcast uh from the podcast itself yeah because um, you mentioned talking about you know how there was this like rocket under you um this need and urgency for you to create it because you feel like the people needed it what so what what would you want us to take away from after listening to you i think there's an awful lot of learning that you have to do i mean the thing that you can't really just buy or just pay someone for is is self-confidence. And I think that comes from working really, really hard and uh, just persevering. And for years and years, like when, when we moved 
my wife is American, but she was living with me in the UK. And then we moved to New York in 2009. And um, it was early on in my career. And, um, you know, we'd go out for a walk at night or whatever. And I just spend half the walk just moaning and saying, I don't know if I'm any good at voiceover, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if I'm making any money. And she was got quite understandably sick of hearing it. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, you have to sort of persevere through all that self-doubt and um, just keep plugging away and keep working on yourself and keep being humble to know that you're not, you don't have all the answers and that you're a constant work in progress. You know, even if you think you're amazing right now, the industry may shift or you may get complacent and you start sort of knocking out auditions without really thinking too hard. And then then you find you're not booking as much anymore and you think, what the hell's happening? Um, Never really stay too comfortable with this stuff. Constantly be on on the ball with where you are and where the industry is and what new trends are emerging and what technology is happening We've got an episode coming out tomorrow that we did with with Jim Canelli. Actually, I know I've spoken to you guys, and he is very hot on emerging technology and people like Gary Vaynerchuk and people like that who who talk about you know emerging trends in voice and stuff like that and where things are happening. So, what's true now doesn't necessarily uh, is not guaranteed to be the same in the future, and the same for your performance and and your skills and what you offer. So I'd say stay flexible, stay humble, and just continue to just work really hard. And that's, I don't know what the percentage is, it's like 80% of your job. (laughs) And if you can do that, and then you've got something to offer in terms of your actual voice and your acting ability as well, I think you're, you're almost, almost guaranteed to have a certain level of success in voiceover. But, you know, there are no absolute guarantees, so... That's what I would say. Thank you. Okay, there we are. You've heard enough of me today, so I'm going to keep this brief. Thank you to all the students at Syracuse University. What a great bunch of young people and really, really interesting questions. And thank you to Tina Perkins for setting that up and asking me to speak to the students there. So that's all for today, and I'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you to this week's guests, our sponsors, J. Michael Collins, IPDTL and Backstage Magazine. Thanks also to Kyle Marie Colucci and Chris Sharps for social media support. Special thanks to Patreon super member Angus Gunn. Join us next time for another class. <laughs>